she's the only one that will crack open fiction and enjoy it. We are live at Salaika <laughs> and welcome to About Islam, the online platform that showcases mainstream Islam to the world. I'm Layla Abdullah Poulos, and this is the Black Muslim Authors Conference 2021. Woo! Okay, don't get me undulating up in here because I'm excited. <laughs> Love that we, are live. we are live and we are on fire and we are ready to go. We ready to go, ladies? Yeah. Yes. Go, right? <laughs> this is the third annual Black Muslim Authors Conference a convening that was started by NBA Muslims and Black uh, uh, Muslim Girl Reads, a great initiative that provides books to urban uh, Muslim schools. So it's been really, really great. The first one was wonderful. The second one was wonderful. Now this one is really special because this one is a month long. We went in, dove in. I actually got the idea from British author Naima Roberts because their Black History Month is in October. And she did a whole month. They did a whole month long thing. I was like, a month? Really? You're going to do a month? Really? You don't think that's too much? She's like, it's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought about it. She was right because we have some great stuff going on all month long. They're gonna be we're gonna have panel discussions on Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and Sunday mornings at 11:30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So as you're winding down from work on Thursday and as you're getting up and getting your coffee and your brunch and your lunch and everything like that, on Sunday we will be here having all these great discussions where authors can connect with readers and with each other and we can talk about the black muslim experience and how that drives our authorship okay so let me welcome our panelists for today our first panelist is um jawaria you guys know her that's our muslim urban fiction writer and children's books dang you do a lot educate everything you you busy <laughs> that's that's how we do right that's how that's we how do. we roll <laughs> She is a native of Springfield, Massachusetts, and a second generation American Muslim urban educator, business owner, and storyteller. She is the author of Tried and Tested, The Size of a Mustard Seed, Hen's Hands, and The Princess and the Good Deed. And you have a couple more, and you have a new one coming out, right? I have a new one coming out. Actually, um, I'm working, I'm, I have another one slated. So we have two for 2021. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta pump it out, pump it out, pump it out. Readers <laughs> want it. They want it. They want Um Jawari. When's the next book coming out? Our next guest is and panelist is Nazima Hutchings of Every Kind of Lady. Every Kind of Lady came on board and they, they, they are organizer, co organizer with Muslim Girl Reads and NBA Muslims for this one. And we need it, I'm telling you, because this is one dynamic, dynamic conference. All right. Nazima Hutchings is an author, award-winning poetess, expressive write writing and literary wellness coach, helping women to heal through writing and build their written legacy. Visionary CEO and founder of Hartford's Literary Integrated Trailblazers, sole owner of the Every Kind of Lady Company, Nazima Journal Designs and Nazima is Sensory Essentials. She has written three poetry books and a self-help reflective writing prompt journal a children's book and edited and authored a number of one bestseller, a number one bestseller poetry anthology, Every Kind of Lady and Her Sister's Pages. That, that oh yeah, that was that that caught on fire. When I yes. saw it, like, oh yeah, if people want that, they just bought that up. They were just like <laughs> grabbing that book. <laughs> oh, and we another fabulous poet, Hyatt Watts, a performer, sorry, Hyatt Watts. Having performed as jihadist on the Hudson poetry scene, and prior to that as a member of the Nashi group Duha, 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 he considers it a privilege to be thought of as an artist, being reasonably successful in several disciplines from the culinary arts to crochet. Her focus has most often been drawn to activist art. Love it, love it, love it. That's right. Spread the word through your art, sister. Spread the word through your art. <laughs> <laughs> has always been to nourish through various creative expressions from food to song, uplifting and shifting the vibration to a higher elevation is key. Having founded the Higher Level Artists Collective, it is one of our favorite it's accomplishments nice. and, it is and it is open to any artist who wishes to memorize, monetize their creative creativity via halal means. Oh, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Khalil, so I like 
Alaikum salam. What's good? Yeah, I just had to set my my brothers straight. They had a the older brothers had a Zoom, and I had to make sure their tech was right. So okay, awesome. Will yeah. works, uh, works with the uh, Islamic Museum in Washington D.C. Yeah, which is not on your bio, by the way. Yeah, I know. I gotta make a new. You gotta update some stuff, brother. You gotta update some stuff. I know, I know, I know, I know. (laughs) I got like I feel a little intimidated because I got a whole panel of poets here, and I've heard all of you drop fire, like boom, (laughs) boom, boom. (laughs) I just I'm just gonna sit back and enjoy (laughs) most of the night tonight. So now Khalil is just joining us. Khalil Ismail hosts events and programs that combine entertainment with educational workshops, social uplifting, upliftment forms, and spiritual consciousness with a focus on topics that impact humanity on personal and community levels. His mission to empower others through art, humanitarian work, and engaging discussions. We gotta talk about that because all of y'all pretty much said the same thing when it comes to that and I kind of have that mission too. <laughs> All right. But before we talk about that, I just want to thank our sponsors really, really quickly, who really saw the value in this uh, convening and decided to support us. And we have quite a few. Hold Hijab, About Islam, first and foremost, About Islam. They've always been great about amplifying Black Muslim voices. Hold Hijab, the Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Heart Women and Girls, Daybreak Press, uh, the African American Muslim Alliance of Tampa and the Muslim Connection, in addition to NBA Muslims, Muslim Girls Read, and uh, Every Kind of Lady. So we got a lot of support this year for this, which I'm glad because it was a lot that we knew was going to be happening and going on. So let's start this off. Every year, we always get the same questions. Like I get hit up with the same thing in my DMs all the time. Why are you doing this? Why are you just centering Black Muslims and everything? I was like, I'm not just centering Black Muslims. I decided to center Black Muslims because it's important to center Black Muslims. We're part of a very rich cultural dynamic here in the United States that intersects faith and uh, race. Uh, and so it becomes, it becomes very, very complex. Okay. And especially for African-American Muslims who are the found, who are, who are the stabilizers of Islam as a recognizable American faith in this society, you know, we, uh, we have so much ownership in our Muslimness and our Americanness and our African-Americanness and our, and our, and our black, uh, African-American heritage and everything like that, that, you know, we really do need a space and a place to really kind of highlight that and see what's happening, what has happened and what's go- what we plan on happening and everything like that. So I have a question, all right? Because uh, Um Juari actually is the one that coined this phrase, all right? And I thought it really, really did uh, just astutely and accurately uh, express exactly what it means to be a black uh, American Muslim. And that is that we are black on both sides. So what does that mean, Um Umjawaria? Black on both sides. Right. So that this is a funny story because it wasn't something intentional. (laughs) I was like, oh, this is black on both sides. We were actually having a conversation and we were discussing the conference and we were discussing some of our our testimonies and um, our trials with bringing this all together. And I said, you know, we black on both sides. (laughs) So it's like, you know, sometimes oftentimes um, as black American Muslims or black um, indigenous Muslims, wherever you are in the diaspora, um, you can get it on both sides, right? You can get tested on both sides of of the coin, right? You have trials as a person of color, especially a black person of color that you have to contend with. And then on the Muslim side, um, you also have those trials as well. and so we are, we're always constantly, that's a burden, that's a trial, that's a test um, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to us, right? And so we know that Allah, those that he tests the most, we don't know if we're tested the most, but we certainly know that we have our share of tests on both sides that we always have to carry. We have to be vigilant about, we have to be um, intentional about how we carry um, these tests. We have to be, uh, I would say, um, 
intentional in how we actually pull up to these tests and deal with certain people when we're transversing um, all of the spaces that we are, we have to, right? Whether we go into the professional world or you go into the trade world or you go into um, the business world, starting your own business, there's always going to be something as a, a black Muslim that you have to, to, to worry about. So yes, black on both sides. Now, I, well, my, my, my story is a little bit complex. I don't like telling my origin story, but I'm a convert and you were born Muslim. And when um, I converted to the faith, uh, I had had experience with black Muslims as a child because my father was a black Muslim. My parents divorced and that was it. I was raised Baptist the rest of the, until I was 18. And when I entered the faith, I kind of expected those things, those, those, those trace memories, uh, it to be like it was then. The things that I can remember as a child and also, I was told, uh, you know, like the, the beauty about the, the fellowship and the, and the brother fraternity of Islam and everything like that. And I, in many ways, I've, I automatically thought it was going to be an escape from being black in America, you know, and I found out it wasn't. I found out that a lot of the things that I have to confront, my blackness stayed with me. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. You know, I love my blackness. You know, I, that's, that's what I was brought up as my family. You, know, you love your blackness. Black is beautiful. I'm a black is beautiful baby. And, uh, but it's just like, you can't uh, shed off the fact that we're human beings interacting with each other. And just because of someone's faith identity, that doesn't mean that they have purged themselves of any kind of anti-blackness or bias and everything like that. And so I realized that inside the, whether it was like you said, inside the educational spaces, inside the corporate world or inside sacred spaces or inside nonprofit, I was still confronted with very similar things across the board and all the time. And it influenced the way that I interacted with people and also influenced my artistry, okay? And as someone who is a beneficiary of the African-American literary tradition, you know, which I hold on to dearly, I let that, uh, that's also been an influence. So, and my Islamic identity has also been an influence because a lot of the stuff that I write is for, you know, like a lot of the characters I write, you, you can't shed e any of it off um, if you're identifying with the faith and you're identifying with the race, you're not gonna really wanna shed it off anyway. And so um, when you're black on both sides, w when do you decide how much of it, how much prioritizes one thing over the other with your artistry? So Nazima, when you're writing a poem, is there times where you're thinking about along the lines that, okay, I really want to center my Muslimness, I really want to center my blackness, or is it more organic than that? It's not something that really comes to mind purposefully or is it something where it's just like, you know, I'm going to do this on purpose. This is just for this, or this is just for that, or can they mix together? Well, I have to say at times it's organic because a lot of times my muse is spontaneous. Um, however, I find myself on purpose when I am looking to write like a, a Islamic piece to say, um, because I am trying to be careful and using, you know, um, certain language and I'm, trying to present myself, you know, as Muslim as, you know, as, you know, because we represent when I walk out the door, if I'm walking out the door as wearing a hijab or people recognizing me as a Muslim, they have these expectations. Um, and now if I'm screaming or angry and I'm, and I'm writing about something about like George Floyd or something like that, and it's not coming all pious and, you know, forgiving or whatever it is, it's coming real organic, it's coming real hard, it's coming real vicious and I'm coming, it's coming real, real. So, and I always say when I pray and I look, get my slams to the left, to the right, I'm black on both sides, you know? So, you know, when Miriam said that, I said, wow, that is deep. Cause when we walk, when we write and everything we do is represented and, um, and that on top, on occasions, on purpose, I would separate both, but every kind of lady um, have a mix. As I say, look, this is every kind of lady. So 
over here you get hurt, over here you get this, and over here you get that. You're going to have to figure it out. I have to let you figure it out. As a reader, you're going to have to work it out. If you have a problem with what's over here in the first three pages, because it doesn't it look like this person got nine personalities, that's too bad. So, <laughs> No, that's okay. It's complex. It is Layered complex. And complex. Yeah. Now, uh, Khalil, all right. So you do you do spoken word, you do hip hop, you do move, short film, everything. You do like a whole lot of stuff. All right. Do you have a, a defining line between your blackness and your Muslimness when it comes to your creativity, when it comes to when you decide to engage in a project? Um, no, I mean, actually, I, for me, it's, it is pretty organic, you know what I mean? Um, but I'm, I'm very intentional about what I, what I like to write about, you know what I mean? So at the end of the day, I just call myself a storyteller who happens to know a, a number of different languages. Like, you know, mm. so I have to know the language of film. I happen to know the language of music and poetry and that type of thing. But it's storytelling, you know, for me, all, you know, all the time, whether it be a personal story or whether there be inspiration from someone else. And, you know, I tend to be very intentional anyway. You know, I tend to be very intentional about what I write, whether it's about Black issues or whether it's about issues that have to do with just humanity. Sometimes... Mm. You know what I'm saying? Um, they intersect. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes it's both. Some because they're connected. And then other times it's just very specifically about a human issue. So it really depends on what I'm intending to actually tackle. Okay. You know what I mean? And and, and you know, I, I my I'm not a person like I've always had ideas in my head. So ideas come all the time. So I'm not like walking around thinking, okay, you know, how can I address it? It just kind of comes, you know? And then I just try to shape it and chisel it from there, you know what I mean? Okay, Haya, you're shaking your head, yes. <laughs> because I can completely and totally relate to the organicness of all of the creative process. Mm. Um, I don't ever really set out in a moment to do something on purpose, unless I'm asked to perform somewhere. And I will ask, as you know now, is there any kind of material that you want, you know, the, the theme or anything? And if they say, nah, we just want you, okay you know <laughs> so um yeah, i know but, that but, i know that whole situation <laughs> but <laughs> but my inspiration it really really truly is organic as organic as biting into an apple which we'll probably talk about a little bit later hey, mine is a little uh, different and i don't know whether it's because a lot I, I started off as a writer and uh all of my writing was very purposeful you know, I wrote uh, journal pieces, I wrote opinion pieces and everything like that. So when I when it came to my authorship and writing my fiction, uh, a lot of it set purpose, it was like a purposeful message and how did I want to layer that message and what influence uh, each was going to have in that message. Because I often find, and, and, and I would really like everyone's feedback on this, but because as a Black Muslim, I often find that I'm on the margins of almost everything, <laughs> you know, um, where, it's just, <laughs> where it's just like, um, all Muslims are not, just not gonna get me, okay? All black people are just not gonna get me. All women are just not gonna get me. Uh, there's very specific groups of people, black Muslim women or black Muslims just like, you know, those there's, there's a higher potential that they'll get where I'm coming from and I don't have to do give a lot of background information on it, and I can get a lot and I can get some uh understanding empathy and validation I'm just going to be honest about it in ways that I can't from other people and so this is the reason why like I feel like uh this convening is so important because authorship in and of itself okay whether you're uh a uh, multifaceted storyteller, okay, like Khalil is. <laughs> I, like all of you are actually, because I looked at all your bios. I like, oh, so yeah, I write fiction, <laughs> like, which I'm perfectly okay with. So whether you're multifaceted or whether you're very much directional and what is, how does you want to tell your stories? Um, there still is just when you produce that work, there do you find that it's just really you're on the mar your work is on the margins i'm gonna go with you first and juaria 
Oh, absolutely. I think that's a great way to even um, describe it. You know, um, I was petrified with my first book. I really was. I put a disclaimer. <laughs> I put a disclaimer in the first page because I was I was scared. I was real scared <laughs> to release that book. Um, and we I was with the late, great uh, Widad Delgado, Rahimahullah mm-hmm. Ta'ala, who backed that project um, and uh, Muslim Writers Publishing. And um, we, we went through the editing and uh, I also had Sister um, sister Deborah um, and we went through the editing and we went through the editing and we talked about the editing and it was just like, should I keep this? Should I take it out? Should I keep this? Should I take it out? Because I didn't know what or who was going to be able to understand, you know, mm-hmm. the, the background, the context of the story, you know, because I'm on the margin, right? It's such, it's such a, a, a slimmer of a, of a space that we, we we take up as Black Muslims, you know? And then even among the Black Muslims, there, there there's different types of Black Muslims, you know? Everybody's not gonna have the same experience. Um, so I was real petrified. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if I was gonna find my tribe back in 2006 talking about urban Muslim fiction, like who does that, you know? Um, so yeah, when I signed on to do that, uh, I, I was I was nervous because I didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah, you are very much a trailblazer <laughs> when it comes to that. No, very much so because when you think of to, to think of the, the the genre of urban fiction, okay, and you think of Black Muslimness, and let's center like African American. Does everyone here identify as African American? I just want to make sure. That's relative. <laughs> well, I mean, African American meaning that you're a descendant of enslaved Africans in the country from Jamestown until the emancipation. Yes, because my yeah. name is Watts. Watts. <laughs> <laughs> Watts. Or one of them, I should say. <laughs> okay, so um, when you think about that, when you think about urban fiction and, and, and Black Muslims, African-American Muslimness, okay, um, we went through a whole period of time where uh, there were very purposeful uh, uh, attempts to alienate us from our African-American heritage and traditions. And urban fiction is very much a part of that. So by you deciding to embrace that, you actually, you actually did something very subversive at the time. Okay, and that was to embrace it and to own it. It's subversive as a Muslim and it's subversive as an African American because urban fiction has very specific content. And uh, you decide, no, I'm going to make this content my own, my own, and the way that I want to do it, which urban fiction usually embraces, but it still can be very jarring when it comes to that. Um, I, when you think along the lines of, say, social justice, and Hyatt, you said that a lot of your work, you like to uh, integrate social justice activism into your, I think all of you are, are, are artists, activists, right? And so when you think of activism in terms of being an African American and fighting against white rage, fighting against white supremacy for centuries, okay, and then using that and and, and being a a covered Muslim woman, so being someone that's obviously Muslim and those two things are not supposed to meet. How how difficult has it been to make those two things meet and for people to appreciate that? I said hi yet. Okay, I was just making sure I was not sure because I I really, my answers to these type of questions always are interesting to people because they're kind of off the beaten path because my parents did not raise us thinking for consciously about being black. They raised us for consciously thinking about we were Muslim and the girls were flowers from Allah's garden and the boys were soldiers of Allah. And so that was our consciousness. So we never really had a, a um, active intention to fight white rage, for instance. It's like I'm Muslim, and so then what? You know what I'm saying? Like that was the thing. That was the that was the crown. Um, and we were made aware of social justice issues that pertain to us, but just not in a way. I don't know. Just not embracing the 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 we are less than 
part of fighting over. You know what I mean? I, I, I have a hard time expressing that that uh, concept sometimes, but it's just like, we weren't raised with this poor consciousness of, we are the descendants of slaves. So that is just a different outlook that we have when it comes to that type of thing. You know, I don't know if, I, if I'm being understood right now, but it's just not. No, I, I understand, I'm just wondering. And it's hard to explain to people because people are so like, yes, and I am too, very much. But you had Very to sooner so. or later come, the, the reality had to hit you sooner or later. Oh, no, I, now we have had some experiences on the roads with my mother where she made mm. it very clear, like, oh, oh, no, and we're not dealing with that. I can't even repeat what this man said out of his car one time, mm. nor can I, in honor of my mother, repeat what she said back to him, <laughs> where racism became a very real confrontation. So, no, we're aware of it, but just the, 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 um, the emphasis was placed more on exemplifying Islam as as the weapon yeah. against it. But you don't think that that your African American heritage influenced that? So, if we juxtapose, oh, it influences everything. I, no, no, no. Don't get me wrong. See, that's why that's why it's, there's this nuance. Oh, it's very influential. Yeah. It's very much a part of everything. Because the rhythm think, and the rhyme. When we <laughs> think about. Um, you know, uh, just like the Black Muslim movement and subsequent uh, uh, sub movements, that that not just Nation of Islam, and you like at the Fuqua Law, and you had the the ones in upstate New York. I can't remember the name. Uh, uh, Imam Jamil, Warthi Mahan. Like you had like this. It's not just one thing. It's like all of these amalgamations of this process of who we are today. Okay. And the generation, the, the generations that extend from that. But when you think about how it is that the people at the beginning, the, the people at the beginning, our, our grandparents and our parents from some of us, uh, thought of, cause it embraced and conceptualized Islam and, and conceptualized how they were going to present themselves as Muslims to the world, it is very different than people of other experiences. And I think uh, that our African-American heritage has a, a, a huge role in, in, in influence in that, in that we, we, we were unapologet unapologetically Muslim, just like we're unapologetically black, okay? And so I think that one feeds the other in ways that it doesn't with people of other experiences. But my question is, does it feed our art the same way? Oddly enough, I actually have a poem called I Will Not Apologize. I've never felt apologetic for being Muslim or black. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I actually have a poem called I Will Not Apologize for Being a Muslim. Like from years ago. <laughs> that well, address is like, no. Think about it from like the, this whole, uh, this larger American Muslim experience, okay, which we are very much a part of. It is, it is very different. I still remember like one, with one example um, when uh, the former 45, the former president. <laughs> that was funny the way you laughed. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I got stitches. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. My roast is, is going off. I'll be right back. Okay, so go sorry. get your roast, sis. Go get your roast. <laughs> so we think about our former president. When he called uh, uh, countries in uh, on a certain continent, s whole countries. Okay, mm -hmm. there was this whole social media thing where it was just like, and I'm this, and my husband's that, and we're this, and we're that, and this, and this, and this, and that, and then that, that. And it was African American Muslims that were popping onto social media, like, don't stand to deliver for anybody. You don't know, have any explanation of who you are. You don't have to defend your humanity and your placement here or anything like that, which I think comes very much from the African-American uh, social tradition in a lot of ways. So when we're thinking about our artistry, okay, when we're thinking about our music, when we're thinking about our filmmaking, when we're thinking about our poetry, when we're thinking about our nonfiction, our fiction and everything like that, uh, it definitely plays a huge role, okay? And so does this month, you know? Um, Black History Month is just like, that's our history. That's our history. And a lot of times it just seems like right now, okay? I love you guys about Islam, just saying right now. <laughs> Roll up my sleeves for a second. Right now, 
there are what I've seen of, you know, just really as um, the, the campaign and optics in order to show uh, a broader ownership of Americanness by Muslims. So in a lot of ways this month, you know, which for years when I was first Muslim, there were all, there were strong debates among uh, uh, black Muslims, African-American Muslims, but who, and um, uh, even non-black Muslims about the validity of this month, whether or not we should observe it. Do you remember that at all? Anybody remember yeah. that? Why are yeah. you doing this? What does it matter and everything like that? And then all of a sudden, you know, a few years ago, it was like, oh, Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali and all of this and this and that, that, that. No mention of Sister Clara Muhammad who founded the first Islamic educational system in the United States, by the way, just real quick. And so it's just like, it becomes like this venture of optics to show the ownership of Muslims in general to Americanness. So in a lot of ways, our African-American heritage is uh, maybe co-opted in order to do that. And I know that there are a lot of organizations that, have, that try to be very careful not to. It becomes a very fine line between supporting uh, this whole idea of developing an appreciation and the value of what this month means, okay? And learn and how it is a very much a platform for education and uh, for uh, us to really just go over again who we are, you know? I think that that's the, one of the important things about this month. And so it's a very fine line when it comes to that. And so this is the reason why we want to do it all month long this time. You know, you can't do it all month long if you are going to a venue and everything like that. So this was kind of an opportunity. You know, uh, the Prophet Islam says that um, a believer see, for a believer, there's good in everything. Okay, so we're trapped, we're stuck. And in ways, like in my brain, I'm just like, okay, but I've never had access to all of these people before <laughs> and get and be able to come together and to talk with all these people before. Now we have an opportunity to do that. So we're going to be doing that all month long. We're going to be having panels all month long, two days a week. So that's kind of awesome. The evening people can have a, the, the, the panel and this afternoon brunch time panel, the whole family and everything can sit in. And, and watch and enjoy and they're all recorded okay and they're going to be on here so people can actually come and see it afterward as afterward as well and we also have an opportunity to have a digital book fair okay which is great i hope everyone filled out their forms <laughs> uh uh you looking a little guilty there brother <laughs> i'm a little guilty i don't know I'm, i gotta i gotta check Fill and see. that form readers want to see it do you know how many like i started nba muslims it's been five years yeah. it's been five years i can't believe it and um i am constantly asked about books not only by muslims but a lot of people are asking books by black muslims okay and uh so it be, they want it people want it and we know it that's why we write it because <laughs> people want it mm -hmm. And so fill out those forms. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Fill out those forms. <laughs> so we're going to have the uh, book fair, the, the whole conference page, which the link is up there. And there's a book fair all month. Every panelist, there's access to their Amazon pages so that readers can take a look at all of the stuff that they have. And on the 28th, there's going to be a book fair with a bunch of books for 99 cents on Amazon participating authors are going to have their books on sale for 99 cents for the book fair. So you can snatch up some stuff. All right. So get your pennies together and snatch up some stuff. And, and get ready for Ramadan too. Get ready for Ramadan. And get ready for Ramadan too. Get ready for Eid inshallah. And get ready for it because you know it's funny because I I um am writing a Ramadan romance. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, we have, and we have and we have Tahib coming in. He has the love and hijab. Love and oh, the love, the yeah. love and hijab in a hijab in a headscarf. That's gonna have me reading. <laughs> uh, love and hijab. Yeah, we. You know, it, I, I start when I started this. Um, 
it was part of my graduate work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Actually, my master's thesis focuses on black Muslim romance authors. Black Muslim romance authors, there's enough out there. Yeah, yeah, they are. And the majority of them are African American, just saying. And uh so when I when I had the opportunity to kind of look and study and focus on this, I really saw that, you know, all with all honesty and a lot of in a lot of subgenres, African American Muslims are kind of plowing and forging these trails and blazing these trails for themselves and for their fellow authors, okay, and for future authors. You know, I mean, how many times do you get hit up with, I read your book, it inspired me to write? Who's never heard that before? Right? So it becomes really important to not only see that you, to see, but also to read and to know that this work is happening and that people are venturing out into, in, into all these different uh, avenues of literature, which is always a great thing. We shouldn't be pigeonholed into one thing or another thing. So that's why it's great when you have like that prolific work that you have, you know, it, it'll, it won't be me, but <laughs> I love it when authors do it. And I have a lot, I have a lot of respect for authors who can do it because I'm a chicken. I'm going to stay where I am. I'm going to stay where I know and what I know. So I think it's really important. Readers want it and readers, and, and I think in a lot of ways, readers need it from the first time we did the black muslim reads on twitter and went viral you know people were showing like they didn't realize like sometimes it's so hard to see the forest for the trees and a lot of times we get this messaging that we uh who's hurt like we don't have a culture uh we're not doing a whole lot or anything like that but then with black muslim reads you saw all these books just like, and, and they're on your shelves. So it's just like, and they're on your shelves. <laughs> but you yeah. never realized, you never really could appreciate it until you saw them all together. And it was just like, oh yeah, wow. And, it's, and, and Black Muslim authors have been pumping out since then. But we do have to face a lot of things. And so uh, when we come together, we talk to each other about our craft, about our art, about the process, about the industry about our genres and everything like that it becomes very very important because this is this is this is hopefully a a space where there's a potential for people to get it and we are we are carving out a legacy you know like habiba Kande always says Mm -hmm. you know the the nigeria brit author he's like make a leg that's what your book is he says your book is a legacy (laughs) all right so leave a legacy with your book so i'm really really looking forward to it I want to go back real quick, real quick. I wanted to go back to your comment about the culture, because I think that's really important, um, especially for our panelists here, um, whether um, with Enzima, with the poetry, with Khalil, he's multifaceted, um, and Hayat with her her writing of her music, um, all of that amounts to culture. Um, But oftentimes in the Ummah, especially in the Ummah, you know, African-American culture is either not accepted or not played up or not even given the opportunity to shine. I mean, I don't know how many times, um, you know, you bring your collard greens or your sweet potato pie to the masjid yes. at certain masjids <laughs> yes. and they try to put it way to the back. Like right. nobody going to eat your collard right. greens. I'm like, wait they, a minute. They go my eat those collard greens. I'm eat sorry. It. You know what I mean? They're going to eat, gonna eat these collard greens. Put that up in the that. front. Okay. Put that up yeah. in the front. Cause I know every, my people want that. Every year. So, I every I used yep. to make this big pan, two wow. big pans of macaroni and cheese. Wow. Okay. The, those were the empty pans. Okay. Yeah, they try it. Like, it is true what, what she said. It is they pushed the side. And I actually yeah. really get offended. I like, y'all just want me to bring the drinks because I'm not about to bring that. Y'all about to waste us. I know <laughs> I can cook, <laughs> but not enough of my people in the front lines. Everybody. But you know, I have to, I have to disagree a teeny tiny bit. I don't think that is that African American culture is is not acceptable. I think that just like with every other non African American culture, it's not acceptable unless when it comes from us. Mm-hmm. Okay, when it's coming from African American Muslims, because you know, quite honestly, you see all of these uh, uh, Arab rappers. Okay, 
uh, in hijab and rapping and everything like that Farsi. badly. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> badly. Except Some... for the Palestinians. I'm sorry. Those Palestinian rappers got it going on. And the Moroccan. <laughs> <laughs> like you gotta listen to them. Like I got some stuff. Kuwaitis students who rap too. They so, are right. Kuwaitis. Yeah. I don't think I've ever heard anyone from Kuwait, but the Palestinians and the Moroccans. <laughs> yeah, and so that's too you know funny. I think actually, I think there is a there is a um and just observing and traveling and being to. Uh, multiple countries and talking to different people about this thing. I think that is funny because it seems like it happens with the food too. I didn't know that, but one of the things that I have definitely come to the conclusion of is that there is a there is a jealousy, you know. And those there are people who admit that who are not black who have admitted that to me that there is a jealousy that we have to overcome because they don't understand why the things that we do have the resonance that it has often with people who are sincere. Like for example, their youth. Like you know, at a certain age, you learn. That black people or or black black things or black created things should be suppressed, but it's not something that comes naturally, which is why a lot of times in their youth the kids tend to follow what we do and follow how we act and that type of thing, good or bad, right? But you know when I was in a, in talking to people all the way up to scholarship, they would talk about how the things they studied from early scholars, some of the stuff from, from about black about the black uh, blacks was pro very problematic very problematic and they're just being real and they're just like hey look we just gotta look at these people are human so it's been a it's been a an effort to suppress there's been an effort to kind of suppress our effectiveness right and i'm gonna tell you the one of the things that i realized is that it's parallel actually with with white supremacy in that way in that see like uh when you look at especially hip-hop when you look at the trajectory of hip-hop and what hip-hop started as and what it is today mainstream you know, it's not that black people, it, people are, we're com people are comfortable as long as black people are acting the fool, mm. right? It, mm. As long as that, you know, you can, you can deal with that, but they're not, that we make people very uncomfortable when we start, when, when we show our, when we show our intellectuality, when we show our ability to affect change with the things that we do, then we become threats and then we become more of a problem. So it's almost like, it's almost like the food. That's why I was so, I, when you were telling about the food, it's like, that's ironic. It's like, the food is a really good analogy because it's like, it's right there. You know, it's good. You know, it's dope. You know, it's going to go first. So you put it in the back. You know what I'm saying? Um, and if it also has an ability to actually affect change, now your power structure is threatened, right? And, and one of the things that I realized when I look at like how, when I compare like what happened to the time of public enemy and then what happens to black people who do black people muslims who try to do music that affects people you know our culture literally is haram where where as other you know other people who use music and use other things it's fine because it's cultural right that's not a coincidence to me mm. no it, it definitely is not a coincidence and it runs across the spectrum i think you can tell me about poetry because I know definitely, definitely in authorship that that is something that, that absolutely exists. And uh, we do, I think that especially black Muslim women authors become a huge threat because we, like you said, we are the ones that are affecting and impacting change in our various, in the industry, okay? Where, it, and in literature was just like, we are not catering and capitulating to certain sensibilities and, and, and existing structures when we write. And we're not allowing anyone to tell us what we don't own and what we do own when we write. And I could see that very much as a threat, you know, just with this idea of, you know, Muslim women write children's books in YA. That's about all they write is children's books in YA. <laughs> then you have Warrior come out with her urban fiction. <laughs> then you have Zara J come out with her romances. And Papetia Bazaar come out with her stuff. <laughs> and it's like, nah, Chief, that's not all we do. That's not all we're going to do. And this whole idea of, of conceived inferiority, perceived inferiority, not conceived, perceived inferiority. And it's just like, no, we are not inferior to you. And it's just like that then starts to break at delusions that they have about who we are exactly. and who they are. Who we are exactly. and who 
they are. And that, yeah, people do not like that. And they will react. Very traumatic. Very traumatic. Can be very traumatic. <laughs> <laughs> them. <laughs> so I tell I tell black people everywhere, really, and it's not even just Muslims that your voice is funny. It's like you know the what what we were, we what we went through. They try to take everything. So it's like what Allah Subhanahu wa Taala did. The gift that He gave us is actually inside. It's our voice. You can't take that. Our voice. When you look at our voice, male and female. When you look at how we use our voice, and I'm just talking about our actual vocal cords. I'm also talking about what we write and how we affect things with the way we communicate. We yeah. take over everything we do. Like, look at the internet. Look at the way they do memes today. Look at, at when we are able to get our hands on or our vocal cords or our pins on, whatever it is, we take over. Give us access. <laughs> don't give us access. Yeah, don't give us access. Open it. Why don't don't. It? Because TikTok, TikTok is a very, very good example. Right now, TikTok is a very good example because <laughs> What do you have on that app? Okay, by the way, get a TikTok just for the video editing alone. Okay, because they have a very great video editor on there. But uh, what you have, Black creatives struggle on that, on that app because the developers themselves suppress Black creatives, all right? And they prop up a lot of, most of the time, white people talking like Black people or mm. non-black people acting like black, quote unquote, acting like black people and using AAVE and all of that stuff. That's what they'll prop up because they don't want the black, they want the black nest. It's like B.B. Watts says, they love and accept our culture, but don't love and accept us as the same. That's the reason why braids, you know, you get suspended from school when you're my skin tone and you have braids, but you Kim Kardashian, oh, that's cool, that's fashion forward, that's fancy, that's fabulous type of thing because they it, when it comes from us directly it's some there's an allergy to it but it's okay to co-opt to appropriate and to overlay our culture like absolutely most definitely and yeah it's happening in muslim culture too it's happening in american muslim culture too let's just be honest yes. about it yeah and uh so it's like we, you're right, we are seen very much as a threat. And that's the reason why we need to come together to have these conversations and to, and, and to bring this out into the light and to, and to show that, you know, like this is something we've been here, okay? And we have been endured and persevered. And that should, that's something that should very much be respected and appreciated. And we're the ones that are blazing the trail. Our culture is dope. It is dopeness. And that's it. Period. <laughs> With a T, right? With a T. I right? remember yeah. I have that whole thing of why that's a word. I did a whole <laughs> I did a whole thing about that, uh, about why that's a word, okay? Because we are like our language is something that is very, very dynamic. It's vilified a lot, okay, but it's fetishized. Mm. It's very, very much fetishized. Wow in a lot of ways so we have to we have to now go through this process when it comes to understanding how we're going to do our what we're going to do with our language okay and how it's going to be perceived and how it's going to be accepted and whether or not we are going to care about how it's perceived and how it's accepted in the society because it's coming from us when it comes from us it's a very very different thing you know than when it comes from someone that is not black, then it's cute, it's kitschy, it's hot, it's 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 the thing and everything like that. And it's like, dude, well, Shaniqua can't say it, but Barbie can. Like, no, <laughs> like what is that? When does that work? And how does that work? And even when you look at um okay, now I'm drawing a blank of names. Wahida, mm, the poet who got her work stolen. Mm. Oh, Ooh, one more food poet. check before it's my turn. turn. Yeah, go turn again. That got her. There was a Muslim, a black Muslim woman poet who another uh, non black poet, woman poet, woman of color poet, basically stole her whole concept of all of her work in the wit and, and, and her format and everything like that and put it out and it became like a bestseller and everything like that. And uh, black poets were up in arms. They was like, You stole that. You a thief. <laughs> thief like straight up 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, but it happens all the time. That's the thing. It's like, it, it happens all of the time. I mean, even now, like in, in romance, uh, black female characters are starting to become a thing more and more in romance. So interracial romances and uh, black love romances are starting to become more and more a thing, especially in rom-com. And so now you have white uh, women romance authors who are writing all black characters and not putting their faces with the book. Okay. I think that is. Because they want to sell the book. They know that the, the automatic assumption is going to be that that's a black author. The automatic assumption is going to be that that is a black author. And there are, there's very much right now in readership, okay, among black readers, people who want to hear, we want to hear our stories from our perspective. Okay, by our writers type of thing. And so when it's a, a white person writing about black people, not saying you can't write about black people, I don't want to read it, but I'm not saying you can't. It will definitely impact the fact that there are black readers that won't pick it up. And it won't, it'll you know, write readers who won't pick it up because it's black characters. So if you keep it ambiguous and you keep it vague and you keep your lily blonde skin and white hair out of the equation, that people are going to make their automatic assumption that it's you or me or some other black author who wrote it. And so that's going to sell books. That's a big thing now. So I ask, has- yeah. So I asked because you see that across the board during the commercials, movies, and I'm like, yeah, I'm seeing it as like a big trend. I mean, is there like a message, you know, xenophobia is a thing, you know, keep our people alive. We got to mix now, you know, accept this, this is what you got to do. You want to stay here on the planet? No, I'm, I'm just being cheeky, but I'm just saying that. <laughs> No, there's some of that that's very real, though. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how that's how like let's talk about it. We're gonna talk about it. Yeah, let's talk about it because you know, and I mean, and and the fact of the matter is, is it's like as it's as more and more of us, uh, as Muslims, Black Muslims, okay. And now we're gonna bring everybody in under that because that's not just African Americans. So everybody, Afro Caribbean, African diaspora, you know. Um, uh, in on the motherland, <laughs> the black authors who are on, on the motherland, UK black British authors and stuff like that. When as we start to embrace more and more that amalgamation that's always been in us, and even though it may have been like you guys have been blessed with the whole idea of it's just a, a thing that has occurred and it's a part of your mi- Muslimness intrinsically. That's just what it is. Or whether it's me, someone who's had to fight for it because I was told you can't be black and Muslim at the same time. Meaning you can't embrace your African-American traditions and her- all of it's haram. All of it's haram. Yeah. Oh. oh my word. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to know. <laughs> you don't want to know. We weren't all at the last sermon, but we got it though. <laughs> no, it was definitely... You can't be black. You can't be, you can't have, first of all, African-Americans don't have a culture, which is an out and out lie because y'all steal from it all the time. And uh, <laughs> you can't be both. You have to shed it all off. You have yeah. to get rid of it. Okay. Yeah. You can't wear the clothes. You got to try and sp- Arabize your, your tone as much as you possibly can. Okay. Yeah. And if you're a black Muslim man, don't marry an African-American woman. That's just going to make more y'all, and we don't want more y'all in our community. <laughs> like, am I lying, hey, Brother Clear? Hold up. If I lie, they, they definitely had an era. I mean, it was definitely an era. I don't, I'm glad, Hamdala, I don't hear it much more, but I definitely remember an era where, where brothers be like, yeah, you got to go go get you one overseas because they X, Y, and Z. I remember that, and I I, used to well, I don't want to say it to oh, my God. face. Well, what's the X, Y, Z? I have to say it to what's my face. They be like this. African American, African American <laughs> men should not be with African American yeah. women. Go to Morocco. Yeah. Go Morocco. To go get you, oh, please don't get started on Morocco. 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 <laughs> and get yourself a wife because she hasn't been tainted 
blah 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 blah. I'm not lying. It's not coming out of nowhere. No, no, I'm gonna write a story stuff. about that one. Yeah, we all. Mm. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm prop, you. y'all. <laughs> I got Moroccans no. in the closet. <laughs> no, you got and, and, and I tell you what, but what I think I learned a lot more quietness because what happened is people did that and they came to find out it was a whole different story. And this whole thing about stuff not being in the closet <laughs> and this whole thing about them being docile. Look, everybody got their own issues. I'm not going to say anyone's better than the other, but everybody got their own issues. Yeah. And for the most part, we Allah made us all that we tend to be more compatible with our with ourselves. And that's has nothing to do with it's nothing to do with somebody actually being better or worse. It's just that, you know, that's how it is. And that's that's what we see. So a lot of brothers who we know who did that end up coming back like, yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I can tell you some stories. But that can't be the only stories. purpose. That can't be the sole purpose. The sole purpose cannot be I'm going there to get this person because of these general ideas that I have about the people, period. Because that, that that's stereotyping. You can't stereotype anybody, okay, and think that it's all going to come out okay. And it's just like, if you're going, and, and, and then the realities of being in a, an intercultural, interracial relationships that, and their own challenges, they do exist, people. Yes. And so, and they exist just, between co-wives as well. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> there is no, there is, I, I'm I just tell people. I'm we just talk about it. We're roast against this. No, just we're we're all looking, talk. We have a problem with looking for um, paradise on earth. You know, the bottom mm -hmm. line is, a, and this is dunya, man. This is a play, like, we're not going to find, you know, uh, paradise. So we're not going to find some perfect thing. It really is, you know, uh, when it comes, for one, it's not just about the problems you can deal with, but there's also, there is real beauty and real love. Like, that that does exist amongst us, you know, and you have to just be open to it. But I think what happens is people are looking for, to escape their own flaws. And so they're looking for perfection in someone else. When you embrace your own flaws, you can then embrace flaws in other people and that's the problem we have to get the self-hatred out of ourselves because that's and we have a double whammy of it because we were taught self-hatred both as black people and as black muslims yeah no i i absolutely agree and that's the reason why like our artistry becomes so important because it, it is a matter of when i have created something and i want to share it with uh you know honestly my people first you know and if other people enjoy it Yay! <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and and that's something that you know, it's not something that's exclusive to Black people or Black Muslims. Everyone does that. Everyone creates, and they're creating. They're speaking to their culture, and they're speaking to their cultural experiences. And so, what does that mean? So, if we come together and we start to hash it out and think about those things. What it means, what does the, what are those levels of art, artistic expressions and the way that we're doing them and what we're seeing and the things that, the changes that we're seeing, which is something that's very much gonna be a part of this month, uh, how that feeds us as human beings, as black people, as Muslims, as black Muslims and uh, uh, across, uh, across the board. So I think that it becomes very, very important. So let's speak in the artistry. <laughs> Let's get it some artistry, okay? So, Sister Hyatt, what you got for us, sis? Okay, I have um, an can old I, can song. I go, and before you start, oh, okay. just I want to tell you real quick. I can't, I have a, my, my throat is really bothering. I'm not going to be able to do anything today. That's why I came, but I said I'm going to at okay. least enjoy the panel. So I'm saying that to say that if you wanted to, people who wanted to, they don't, don't be condescending to me because I'm not going to be able to do anything today. <laughs> um, I have to kind of keep docile in order to keep because my throat is really I don't know what's going on. Inshallah, I don't have COVID again. But uh, you know, so I was saying that to say if you had so actually to say if people want to take more time regarding me. Um, you know, okay. go ahead. We can get Miriam to drop a few bars too because she oh. she be coming she be coming out the box. Don't don't be looking <laughs> like that. We know how you do. Don't even act like it. <laughs> she not that tonight. <laughs> Nazima, come on, sis. <laughs> You can't leave. <laughs> I gonna go first, and then I was looking. I mean, yeah, I was ready to go first anyway because that was. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. So yeah. you got time. <laughs> okay, well, right. I got it. You don't want me to read one of the, an excerpt from my book now, do you? <laughs> I would like to hear one, but <laughs> um, 
Okay, well, I am going to um, just give a little brief uh, backstory on where this song came from. Um, I was minding my business. I like fruit and uh, gala apples are the bomb. So I uh, just minded my business standing against my countertop, bit into this apple. What she do that for? When I tell you this apple had a balance of sweetness and tartness and crunchiness and it was bursting with juice like this apple was so good that i was like now if this apple in this earthly plane is this tasty i can't even imagine what an apple in jannah would taste like thank allah for this apple because this apple is good and then this song came to me in about 30 minutes <laughs> so <clears throat> It's called I Can't Imagine. I can't imagine what it would be like. I can't imagine what it would be like to meet my creator and have him be pleased with me to meet our Nabi in his holy court. I can't imagine what would it be like to walk through the gates to see the Sahaba? Oh, won't it be great, so great. I hope I get the chance to see all the things the Quran tells about the garden with rivers flowing beneath and the fruit so sweet. Ya Rab, won't you let me find rest? under your tree or better still if you will please grant me firdos i hope i get the chance i can't imagine what it would be like to meet our Nabi, I'd give a thousand lives to behold his countenance, to behold his countenance just once, just once. If a tree wept to lose his proximity, then what must it be like to be in his majlis? Ya Rasul, so that I may sit with thee, won't you please, if need, intercede for me? I'd give a thousand lives. What would it be like to walk through the gates to see the Sahaba? Khadija and Ali, Abu Bakr and Umar, Uthman, Hamza, and Bilal the Mu'adhin. Ya Allah, how I wish to see them. The first 
whose thirst was quenched in the well of Islam. I can't imagine what it would be like. I can't imagine what it would be like to meet my creator and have him be pleased with me to meet our Nabi in his holy court. I can't imagine. Thank you. Jazakallah khair. Shukran. Mashallah. So beautiful, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Such a dope writer you are. Bars, bars, bars. I didn't even know you had all that talent, man. I didn't even know. I saw you do a poem, but every time I turn around, it's a new dimension. I didn't even know. <laughs> that's the beauty of when you you know it, i know that artists creatives across the board everyone we all have to we we go through these these emotional struggles when it comes to our work okay because you know for many of us you know we want to maintain a positive productive relationship with our lord and creator and what that means is going to be different for everyone. But I think that we disservice creators when we think about, when we assume that they don't do the, they don't go through that kind of like internal struggle of deciding exactly what it is that they want to do with, with the, the talent that Allah gave them. Yeah. You know, my daughter said, you know, it was funny because my daughter said, you know, um, not one person in this house can sing. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, Mom, nobody, no one in this whole family <laughs> can hold a note. Okay. And it, like, she's a very talented artist. Okay. Um, uh, my son recites Quran beautifully. Their father is brilliant. My, uh, I got a, a little a performer, like, you know, like she likes to act out things and everything like that. I got my military one. Like, everybody has all these talents. I got my computer geek. Everyone has all of these talents, but not one of us can hold a note. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and, and that's funny because in my family, it's like, you know, you have singers, you, you just sang, they sang in the church, you know, and stuff like that. So it's just like, yeah, that's, it's possible. It's possible. It's possible that there could be a whole entire family of people that one person can sing. There may be a whole entire family of people that not one person can write. It could be a, like, you know, it's just like talent is something is a blessing from Allah. And we end up struggling because so much of the society of uh, tells us that there's something wrong with our talent that Allah has given us. Okay. Whether it's uh, on from a faith aspect of people's arbitrary decisions about what is halal and what is haram, okay, because they are very much arbitrary and cultural. Or if it's coming from outside of that, it was just like, you know, the way that you express yourself becomes a problem and it becomes an issue. You know, uh, you know, you don't write well, you know, because I don't get the language that you're using. So that must mean that there's a problem with it. <laughs> All right. And so we have to go through those constant struggles. So it's just like we have to really appreciate when oh, there's another song request, by the way. <laughs> so I would just shut up. Do you got another song? I mean, I have songs that, that come off of my uh, my sisters and I and a friend of ours um, CD and one of oh, them you got a CD. Um, Where's your CD? You're so old. <laughs> can, can I just can I just share this because um, my my middle daughter Hind loves Hayat and her sisters and and I was thinking about who can I get um, as a performer and my daughter Hind um, she reminded me 
um, <laughs> Hayat and her sisters. She loves them. She listens to them on repeat every single day. And as most of you know, my, my middle daughter, Hen, from Hen's Hands, she is globally delayed and autistic. Um, and so uh, this is, you know, she sits and she listens to you just Aww. about daily, <laughs> and she rocks and she mm -hmm. she just loves you all. So from our family to yours, uh, we make dua for you all the time in your system. Oh, I'm in love. I'm I want to see Joy. the CD. So you need to plug the, the CD. Where's the CD, I need the CD. I need the information. Yeah. So <laughs> you the know, request is for you. Is that on Amazon? I can't get it's it. They, they on YouTube. No, this was before Amazon that this <laughs> oh, well, CD was got, released. No, you got to bring it back out. Amazon. <laughs> but you got to bring it That's back out. That's actually what, what I, I'm, we're trying to do that for real. Yeah, like release it. Come back. Come back. Get version, it back. Because everybody's voices are so much more mature now too. Yeah. So that was us as like teenagers. <laughs> and my daughters are looking. They're looking. They've been singing Khalil's song all day on day. <laughs> so yeah, I, gotta put, I, gotta yeah, I can do one. <laughs> <laughs> they would love it. They would love to see a black Muslim woman singing and everything like that. They would love it. Let I me can I, do I, you I, mean I, me I, a Muslim I, I, if I remember the words off the top of my head? Go so get Hindu. She know the words. I want to I ask a question because I do now that it's coming back. I rem, I do remember y'all. I do remember hearing y'all sing together. Right. I remember y'all. Saying together, you you and your sister saying together, yes. right? And I think, like I said, I learned I really learned about your your talent when um like last year it was a poetry something that we we did and you did a poem. And okay. I was like blown away. I was like, okay, because your poetry is so is super dope too. Thank um, you. um, but my question is, um, have you struggled with the idea of coming out as and be, and singing like you know has that been a struggle for you in the in the years like has it been because you might have had probably multiple projects except that you're trying to figure out what's the best thing to do as a muslim yeah pretty much um yeah. um having to edit your own desires is always the thing that <laughs> has been a struggle for me even more than the outside influence or attempt the influence of you can do this but you can't do that and you can do this but you can't do that and you're a girl so you can't do nothing you know what I mean yeah um yeah. so me personally I actually prefer to perform whatever um if it's being sung I actually prefer to perform behind a, a like a partition like mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like that Japanese theater puppet you know <laughs> I prefer mm -hmm. that because I always feel like whether it's coming from inside myself or possibly from someone else, I don't even want anyone to think that at any point I'm trying to be enticing. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Mm -hmm. And singing is pretty and sing, male or female singing is very, it's, it, when it's beautiful and melodic and all of that. Um, and the, the juxtaposition between what's halal and what's mm -hmm. crossing the line, just as a Muslim, but also as a female, as a, mm -hmm. as a, as a lady. You know, you know what's interesting to me? I'm sorry, Layla. I'm I'm being interviewed right now. No, don't keep it up. But, but you know what? What's I'm what's good. interesting to me is when I when I look at like uh, one of the things that that I just kind of observed about even like the whole culture of what we see as enticing, right? But what's most interesting to me is that like even when you look at just culture in general, it's always been the male singers who've actually had the problem in terms of what with women like you know you don't find like when you hear women you hear males with goofies you don't hear women who go out and sing and then have a bunch of goofies coming after them but you do hear that with males yet interestingly enough when you, ha you hear how we islamically spin it we always talk about how the woman is the one who all is enticing the male sexually yet the culture shows that actually that actually when you look at culture it's the male who it, the male singer who ends up with the most problems when it comes to what he brings right um, so that's also, that's been interesting to me. And of course, you know, um, understanding and, and studying under certain people, I've, I learned that certain, some, sometimes, you know, there were, there were uh, obviously totally um, and, and within the context of modesty, you know, there was sometimes little, you know, that some girls were asked to sing or that type of thing. It was very, um, very um, innocent, even amongst the time of the prophet saw something, right? So, so we have far more when it comes to that than, you know, than what we present. And, but what's interesting to me is that the, the, the narrative, because for example, a woman singing is far more taboo than even instruments. Like when you look at Islamically, probably the worst thing you could do is have a woman singing, even more than musical instruments, right? That's how, that's, that would probably yeah. be the most looked down upon thing. Yet, 
what I, and yet they'll say the one halal thing is the male can sing. He can't use instruments, but if you would say the most halal thing is probably the male singer. But the most interesting thing is, is that the male singers are the ones with the most, when you look at actually what happens, it's actually the male vocalist who tends to end up bringing the most trouble upon him when it comes to that type of, you know, uh, you know, immodesty that happens. So I just wanted to state that observation. <laughs> well, because it's just, that's what misogyny is. It is about yeah. the suppression <laughs> of women <laughs> and, and, and the repression of them and the, the, the erasing of them from public spaces at all costs to the point where, I mean, and it's a global thing. It's just not, a, it's not just a Muslim thing. I mean, when you think about the whole idea of uh, choir, choir singers and during the Renaissance and how they, uh, you know, um, oh God, I can't, I can't think of the word. <laughs> they castrated, they castrated. Uh young boys because uh so that they can keep their high voices uh you know in shakespearean plays men play women's roles uh I, and um even now you have in certain muslim cultures where uh young men are are encouraged to dress like women and dance for men they're not dancing for women they're dancing for men so mm. it's this whole double-edged misogyny and and and, and mm. seeking to control and repress actual women but still wanting those uh accoutrements of femininity around in those spaces it's mm -hmm. sick as all get out but I'm, and, and, I'll, and i'll say this which is i respect like even when she was saying that her struggle is like okay i would rather do this because even as a man like i'll say there's certain things that i don't do or say there's a whole lot i would say that i don't say literally in the name of just okay i'm a muslim and i and what's my line and i think that like I actually take benefit from the warnings, for example, of music. I do think the one, like the Prophet did warn about music. Like that, that's, you know, that's reality. So, you know, but I think sometimes what happens is we go too far. We want to, when we get into, like you said, misogyny, which is all about control. All this is about control. We are, we're trying to control people left and right, right? And when you get into control mechanisms, where now you go far beyond, like there were things that the Prophet warned about what, you know, maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't go as far as make it outright haram. And then people later then made it outright haram. You know what I'm saying? And maybe there was a reason for that. It's so that you could actually be cautious because it is not like at the end of the day, there is trouble. Like you can't just go out and be free. Right. And so I find, I have found benefit. I, I on the other side, I'll say this. I have found benefit actually in being Muslim and doing music because to me, it, it helps me actually watch myself. Like, I, like I, I'm scared. Like, what scares me is those people who think that they're in a space where they don't actually have to worry about their sin. Well, when you think about, like, what did the uh, prophet said that the prophet uh, Ibrahim, it was Ibrahim or Musa, Musa, I think it was, said, if you don't fear Allah, do as you please. <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's going to happen that's exactly <laughs> what is going to happen i right. think that uh uh for so many creatives it's like you we don't need the 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 aunties and the uncles and the 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 scholars and 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 the sheikhs for trying to brandish us with this stick of shame shame for your artistry because we do it to ourselves because we're scared a lot of us are scared it's like if i do this if i put this out you know there's an impact of everything that i create with it impacts my relationship to allah it directly impacts my relationship to allah if that doesn't scare me <laughs> yeah don't, don't you worry cares if nothing else does you're writing, Andrea, you're writing scripts, movie scripts now, right? So one of the things that I want to know, <laughs> I guess I'm saying uh, interviewer, I want to know. Yeah, ask all the questions. What, what is your, like, because one of the things that I think is, is tough, and especially as a person who's done film, is I think a lot about what's the line. Because, you know, movies, for example, relationships, we know that one, Relationships are the biggest business there is. It's all like if you want to talk about like just what most people are interested, they're most interested in the in the relationship. And usually the male female dynamic, right? That's just reality. Most people are interested in that. That's what that's what gets most people's attention. And then usually if you're poetic, that's what you're you tend to be interested in. If you happen to be a person who writes 
and that type of thing. And I don't count just poet poets as poetic. I can I count writers. Layla, you would be a type of like you would be fit in the category of also a poet. You know what I'm saying? Actually, anyone who kind of writes any type of actual fiction, I would consider a poet. My my point, my question is, what do you how do you do you struggle with trying to figure out how you want to depict reality, right? Without crossing lines like do you have that those questions when you when you're writing what you write and what you want to do it in in movies um absolutely we're gonna uh, we're gonna I have, have to a whole you. yeah i know she's gonna <laughs> have to wait for the screenwriters yeah. you're gonna have to wait for the screenwriters but i think uh, that actually is applicable to actually also with my novel writing as well and yeah. I, I think layla we've discussed that like layla is a full-on um romance writer but i have i have created boundaries um within my urban fiction for that i try to create the illusion um and i i, I think i do it okay but i've i've never gone to the heights of layla as she has with her romance fiction um, untamed. yeah she untamed like but but i you know in this out there come on right you are, but again, because we have these parameters, right? We have these parameters, whether you're doing poetry or you're singing, you're doing your songwriting or you're doing screenwriting in your mind, of course, you want whatever sort of art that you create, you still think in your mind, is this going to be pleasing to Allah? Is he going to accept this from me? You know, because at the end of the day, when you're talking about what a, a Habib had said, you know, this is our legacy, right? So this is going to come with me on the sirat. <laughs> this comes mm -hmm. with me. I'm pulling this. Mm -hmm. To a loss of how what that when I stand in front of him, how is he going to view my work? Is it going to be for or against me? You know, and I want everything that I do. I, I mean, I in my mind and in in my heart and my soul, I'm thinking that this is still a part of my ibadah. This is still something that I'm trying to give representation to us um, now in the future, um, so that we can see ourselves and that we can have something to hold on to, something that's going to um, continue to push us to remember who we are, our names, um, and then our, our, our seeking nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in that space of screenwriting, I'm still trying to create those stories that you know will have a connection to the people that will be um, still create some sort of intimacy, but at the same time, um, have some sort of parameters and, and script writing is, is a little bit more challenging. I will say that. And then we'll get to that when we get to that. <laughs> Fade the black. Fade, the, Fade the black. <laughs> we that, that, that's the great thing about this, this year's conference is that we have a whole bunch of panels that are covering different genres. I mean, and on, um, Sunday, it's, uh, inspir inspiring the next generation with words that's youth books. Okay, um, then on the filing um, f next Thursday, we have Writing While Black. Okay, that's our poetry panel. Okay, and then on the 14th, Valentine's Day, ironically enough. <laughs> you chose it. <laughs> I chose it because I chose a Sunday. And then I was like, oh, it's Valentine's Day too. And uh, we actually have a Muslim author who wrote a Valentine's rom-com, by the way. She's going to be on the panel. Uh, Steam and Dean, okay, that's the romance writers panel, and then on the 18th, it's Fade to Black, that's our screenwriting panel, and on the 21st, it's Release the Ink, that is our Black Muslim male authors panel because uh, Muslim authorship in, in the United States is very woman dominated, <laughs> that's just the fact of writing. It. Writing in and writing. of itself, yeah. all type of writing has yeah. seemed to become. Is that just Muslims, or is that is it is it also the case outside of Islam? I think it's the case outside as well. Okay. I think I think so, and I think that there are some genres that uh, are. I, I don't think there's any genre that is close to being male dominated, except maybe horror. I think more horror, but like romance, forget mm. it. Yeah. Mm. Children's book, forget it. Yeah. YA, forget it. It's like just women, all right? And uh, for the most part. And uh, where were we? I said the 18th is Fade to Black. Is the screenwriter's panel on the 18th. Release the ink on the 21st. Then Do for Self, which is the self-help authors panel. So we have some great authors. I didn't name all these authors. I just named the panels. I should have named the authors. So let's go back. 
<laughs> so we have Inspiring the Next Generation, which is on the 7th, which is this Sunday. So grab a coffee, grab a bagel, grab uh, if you're keto, then grab a keto waffle. Wait, they got to get the coffee mug, though. You so they can be the all coffee. like this. Mine came. What did I do? Oh, here it is. Mine yeah. came to my black. <laughs> <laughs> I'm bad at this. I'm bad at this. Da, 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 da. Uh, <laughs> so I to make sure we have those two. Okay, so you have that link. Panel, which is uh, Um Juaria, uh, Janet Grant, Amina Muhammad Diggins, and Sharia Schultz is coming. She is Shultz. there. She's there. We got yeah, her. Switch everything up. No, I love her book. I love her book. All right, and then on the eleventh is writing while black, which is our poetry panels. Who are our poets, uh, Nazima? Who are our poets? Okay, so all right, y'all gonna have to tune in because it's gonna be a Mira Shabazz Bilal. She is the hostess of When Women Speaks and When People Speaks, and her nephew, Uninvited Maine, and he's um, you know, he's a performer. He has he do like videos and things. So you guys, you guys are gonna be in for a treat. And then we have Nadira Nash. And she has a book, actually. We're going to have to hit her up because I think her book is on Kindle, too. So, but Nidera Ness, and her book is called Bloom, and a mirror book is called Breathing Through Concrete. So, that's what I have. But last but not least, will I have Miriam? Maybe Miriam will join us. So, that might be a treat for us. I'm looking. But anyways, yes, look forward to seeing us Thursday, the 11th at 7 o'clock. I have to keep bugging her. I have to keep bugging her. <laughs> She's amazing, y'all. Listen, <laughs> I would tell this story every chance that I get. At our first convening, authors, all these authors were signed up to do an, an excerpt from their books and everything like that. And so, it was, it was winding down to the end of the day, and I got to her name, and I was like... Uh, you need to read and she just she just she was all the way in the back and she had this beautiful blue flowing uh abaya on and and hijab and everything like that and she just waltzed herself up and she was like i don't feel like reading anything right now and it was like boom 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 <laughs> boom 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 and then she walked off the stage <laughs> So, yeah, we got to keep bugging her because she didn't do it last year. You didn't do it last year. We got to keep bugging her. And on that 14th of Stephen Dean, that's me, author Sana Wright, Sarah Allen from the UK, and Nasheed Jackson, okay, author of Her Justice and everything like that. So that's going to be really awesome and cool because we've been working a lot over the past couple of years with Muslim Romance Authorship. Then we have Fade to Black. Who's on your panel for Fade to Black? Those screenwriters, which is hard. We have Malik Salam, who is going to be with us. We have Malika Shabazz. We also have, who am I missing? We also have Tohib Adajuma. And um, we're hoping to also pull in Nia Malika Dixon, inshallah. So we're hoping she will be available that day. Okay, awesome. And on uh, the 21st is the male panel, which Nashi Jackson is moderating. We have Tar Tuare, Malik Sal Salim, and um, Imam Rashid, Rashid Mahdi. Mahdi. Imam Rashid. Rashid Mahdi. And then on the Do Yourself panel, the self help, Do for Self. Okay, I had to do that. I had to do that whole Elijah Muhammad Do for Self. Couldn't help it. Uh, we have Halima de la Vera. Um Zakia, Asia Nasir, and Sister Angela. Sister Angela. Angela okay. Rahim. Angela Rahim, the herbalist. The Ooh, herbalist. Nice. And then our final one on the 28th, which is also the day of the book fair. We have black on both sides. So it's a whole bunch of us. And we're going to have the three of us Um Jawaria, Nazima, me, Halima, Um Zakia, Brother Khalil. All right. Uh, Hafesha Fazar from Jarabi Katab and new author Amani Jabbar, whose book has been hitting it. <laughs> Her book has definitely been hitting it. People have been loving it. People have been connected to it and everything like that. So it's really an exciting month. 
We're going to be talking about all kinds of things. And so I'm really looking forward to it. Okay. But we still have that song request. Yes, we do. The There's a okay. request for a brother Khalil too for a poem. Okay. Oh, <laughs> can't sing. Oh, yeah. Because you, you was asking. You can't <laughs> sing. You can't sing, but you they can. They said you can do a poem. <laughs> let let our sister kill. She she's good enough, man. I, I is killing it out here. Go ahead. I was just gonna showcase my sister's song. Um, that kind of highlights that that confrontation you have sometimes with your old friends that are who are kind of going in a different direction than you, and you still love them, but you realize you might have to love them from a distance. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, okay. I, I think she called it "What Is Wrong with You," even though that's a funny title. But um, okay. But that's how it starts too. Left. <clears throat> what is wrong with you? Why do you do the things you do? We used to be such good friends. Those kind of friendships don't end when I see you around. I hardly know who you are. The light is gone from your face. You don't want to be a disgrace. No one knows the time that they have. This could be your very last chance. I'll be here if you change. But if you choose to stay the same, I'll miss you. It was a real brief, short one. Um, Did you try to make people cry or something? Did you try to make people I, cry, okay, man? I need, no. I need a couple. Of, I need, I need your songs. I need your songs and some tea, and just to keep my kids up out my house. And be like, I need to feel myself. So let me just sit back with some tea and lay I'm back. So serious. Oh. <laughs> Dude. Gotta get this thug tear off me, man. <laughs> just, just one thug tear, yo. Dang. I mean, we had some upbeat joints or whatever. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have to go with what I remember the words too in five days. <laughs> but yeah. That's her song. I love that song though because it actually describes a part of my life where I literally had to break up with one of my friends, mm. and I'm the type of person who like breaks up with you. I don't let you wonder why I fell off, nor do I let you just fall off, you know. So <laughs> you don't ghost nobody. No, I don't know. That's so traumatic. It's just so I'm such let a person know. It, le it leaves PTSD. You know what I'm saying and trust issues. So I just like to let people know, you know. Like you doing this and I'm doing you're that. You're a raggedy mess and I'm leaving. I'm gonna tell you why. <laughs> See, and that's not, that wouldn't be the energy the per se. Mess. <laughs> that's not the energy <laughs> per se. <laughs> it is love you right, deliver. I would rather but... have that. I would rather that. That would that would, I would rather that, even if that was the case, though. You know, so that's that's dope. Yeah. Yeah. But what? Someone to write a laundry, tell you a laundry list of why they don't want you in their life anymore? <laughs> <Raggedy. laughs> nah, no, ghost me. Know, so I, I have clarity. I, I, nah, I ghost clarity. me. Clarity is good, though. <laughs> clarity is good. Yes, I like, I like, good. I, like, I like I'm, clarity. I'm clear that you don't want to deal with me anymore. And I'm, <laughs> off, I'm just take you off. And that's it. And go on with my life. And go tra traipsing through the tulips. I don't need you telling me. What you <laughs> no, but the way I addressed it with this particular friend, it actually, she understood where I was coming from and she was mm -hmm. still going where she was going. And so that was like, all right, sound like them. Sound like them. Yay. I'm going to go with, go with peace. But <laughs> I, I can't go with you. I, I got to just, I got to go. 
But yeah. see, I'm I'm the ghosting type. I'm just like, well, have you heard? From me? <laughs> no, okay then. <laughs> what? What? What's the... No, that's not true. Because I have people like you. Just sometimes you fall out of touch, and I've had people like, "Are you mad at me?" And I'm like, "Who is this?" Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. So who is this? No, because that's how long it had been since, the, like, I got switched phones, and it's <laughs> no, I'm not mad at you. Why would I be? Hey, if anybody knows me, you gonna know if I'm mad at you. That you gonna know. You gonna definitely right. know if I'm mad at you. Why I'm mad at you? That was beautiful. And again, it's just like there are things that happen in our lives, and you know, creatives can bring that out in ways that we connect to it. Yeah, yeah. that becomes so important. I mean, how many times have we had something? We've seen something. We've heard something from an artist, and it just like gave us air. I think yeah. I was just the other day, Nazima, on one of your poetry reads, it was a poet on there. And I actually had to take a deep breath mm. when that poet was finished. And I just was like, oh, I need some air after that mm. one. And it was just very cathartic and everything like that. It just really made me realize that I had all of this time because I had been in so much pain. I was mm -hmm. not breathing fully. Mm. Ooh, and it was just like oh I need some air I realize that now but this is what artistry does and so if we're always uh, browbeaten about it you know uh, how can we give it to the world right. how can we give it to the world and, and if our culture is so dynamic multifaceted and just really full of energy and fire and coolness and all of that stuff. How can we not keep delivering it to a world, to the world without it being stolen from us? And in a way that it energizes our culture, ourselves and beyond. So yeah. it, it becomes- a very yeah, and, I'll be, and I ain't gonna lie, I'll be irritated when, it, when I hear stuff like that too, because like what you just sung, Kaya, because it's like, that's what I want to hear from Muslims. You know what I mean? That's what I want to hear from Muslims. But, you know, and then like a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the surface stuff is what we end up, is what we end up getting. Cause they don't really have a conscience or really care about, like, it's not really, I don't know how much it's really about the depth and the art for them so much as it's about, Hey, you know what, you know, I, you know, I want to do this, you know what I'm saying? So that's what happens is like a lot of times the, 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 the Muslims who have that, who, who have that type of insight. Because, you know, art, you know, our, our, our tradition historically, even as Africans, was that our griots, you know, our griots, they preserved our history. They were our counselors. They were, our, they were um, consultants to, you know, to government. They, they played uh, actually a big role in community life in general, right? Yeah. And, and we've kind of relegated as a culture, Muslims, to you know this one space. Hold on one second. I think somebody should. Yeah. Somebody back here. Oh yeah, just on. Just okay. One second, y'all. So, you come on. We can still see your hands not big enough. <laughs> 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 that's okay thank you okay hold no. on since he's doing that hold on i gotta <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> i gotta no, I was, straighten myself I was, up i was slowly sliding down this chair <laughs> oh my goodness y'all didn't notice get... i was doing that about 20 11 times i was slowly <laughs> sliding down this chair and everything like but you know I yeah. understand exactly where you're coming from, Khalil, but how much of that has been alienated from us? I mean, her soulfulness is part of our African-American tradition. Absolutely. And it was something that was usually started where? In the church, okay? I know. But it's not something that is in the mosque. or even But she's going to get the, the worst, I'm going to be honest, she's going to get the worst scrutiny. That's why it's hard yeah. for people. Oh, like yeah. That. She's gonna get more scrutiny than anybody else. You know what I'm saying? And that makes it hard. At some point, it's like, okay, you know, is it even worth it? And then at the same time, are people gonna give them the same give them the same support? You know? So that's that's a you know, for me, like that's been a it's been a very, you know, difficult thing to kind of watch because it's like, you know, we know we have that talent, but it's the same thing. All the people who I know who have been that talented, you know, they also wanna live whole, full, balanced lives outside of their art. They're not just artists, right? 
So they mm. still, you know, they, so, and, you know, if this is going to cause you trouble, you're not going to be able to even sustain and stuff like that. You got to find other things to do to, to live a full life. Yeah. You know there what is I mean? a consequence. There, yeah. there is definitely a consequence. And I think that's why a lot of times, I mean, when you think about things uh, like hip hop, urban fiction, Muslims have been, black Muslims have been a part of those things since their inception. Yeah. You know, but it's been it has been under the radar. You're absolutely right. You know, you probably have to hide being a Muslim or or act like you're not really a practicing one in order to kind of really be, you know, to be out there to do that type of thing. It's changing now. Hopefully, Layla, you're probably one of the ones who's helping change it. But the point is that that's how people have. You're right, because it has been historically there. But a lot of Muslims in that way, it's almost like you almost have to be ashamed. Like even even when I look at like a lot of hip hop and a lot of even like we look at comedy, a lot of the best a lot of our best will kind of shy away from from wearing their slam on the front because yeah. they're you know what i'm saying because it's been you know you've been so scrutinized it's like okay and then those people a lot of times they don't want to misrepresent so they're like you know i'm not going to put that in the forefront you know what i mean mm-hmm. so it's an interesting thing and so and for some is that this is my faith it's a very personal thing and i don't mm-hmm. want it a part of my life as a performer or a part yeah. of my variety or anything like that this is where i find solace and so I want to keep it out of that aspect of my life as well. So that's something that you always have to think about too. And uh, how much of yourself are you going to give as an artist? And and that includes your faith identity. Yes. Well, does- I wanted to say with that is that when she mentioned Khadijah's name, when she lit, when she started list, list, um, listing names, our face lit up. I watched us. We was all like, <gasps> you know, the hear a song with that. I mean, we lit up. And so in our narratives, our names are spoken, our what we eat is spoken, the way we, our whole swag, everything is spoken, and we crave that. So we crave it in the dark. Is Allah not watching us in the dark? But we, we still, <laughs> no, <laughs> seriously. And then it's like, what is there, like, we have our limits, okay? But is it our limits, or is it, is it, is it really Allah's limits, or is it somebody else's altogether? I mean, I mean, I'll tell you what, I mean, the, one of the most profound, obviously, and everybody knows this, the, what, one of the most profound hadiths to me is the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu has Aisha on his shoulder. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, because, you know, you're watching, not, you're watching dancing, and I'm not just talking about men, you know what I'm saying? So you got, like, we got to understand what's happening here, right? And, and he's, he, but he understands what's happening. This, we are a people that need to connect through our, through our rhythm and through our, you know, and through our, like I said, through our heavy speech and through our song, we, when you, and when you visit Africa, then you're like, man, if, I, if, if someone ever took song away from those people, it would be like cruel punishment to them because it's like literally like walking, right? Mm-hmm. So to take song away from them, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, they already are going through, a lot of them are going through X, Y, and Z, but they're happier than us. Let me be honest. If you really go and you sit amongst, okay, like, I need some of what you have. Right. I need some of what you have. And I've heard Muslims who literally have say, you know, one of the things they miss when they come to Islam is like, you know, the one thing I do miss is the church, the singing in the church. They say that because they're like, I don't get to have that part. And I'm like, and so what other Muslims do is they try to, and I'm like, for me, I'm like, okay, that's why what I do as a, as, as a, as a Muslim who does songs, I actually try to do, and I, and I don't hide away from being black. I don't, want to do Arab music just because, you know, I do so, I try to do soulful stuff in my style, right? Because I'm like, we can have that without having to make it religious. Meaning, you understand what I'm saying? Even we can talk about religion without making it worship. Like, meaning like, you know, there are people who go, uh, to me, like sometimes they might cross the other line and they try to bring in things into the religion, right? To try to make up for that, which I don't agree with. But I'm like, you don't have to. You can do your stuff and just be like, I'm a Muslim who does this and give people that thing that they need because we need that. Like, like, cause like my sister, like my sister said, we in the dark, we gonna go find it anyway. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? In the dark, we gonna go find it anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. But I will say this though, um, from, you know, the black American Muslim childhood experience growing up here as, uh, you know, black Americans, we always had songs. You know, that was one yeah. thing that I connected with Hayat, we were talking about, I was like, how you, do you know this song? 
from long ago. And she was like, girl, here's the link. I was singing it just the other day. <laughs> we, we, we always had songs, we, you know, and it wasn't like, you know, you look at the last poets, they were Muslim. You look at so many different people from every generation before us, Muslims in this country, song has been passed down. And like Khalil said, if you go to Africa, if you go to the Gulf, they, they sing for their own different purposes and for their own different events. And so I think that's always been embedded into the Dean. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu he had his own song that they made for him, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's like, no, that's if not- we can't catch church. a clue from that, I don't, right. I don't know. Right, that, that's not, <laughs> from, for me, that's not, that, that's not the church. You know what I mean? That is, that is something that is embedded, that is to, to, to sing, to, to not just praise someone, but to give them their flowers while they're still here, right? To acknowledge yeah. them, to give yeah. them, to, to send mercy and, 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 and do I, uh, uh, upon them. You know, that's something that we were taught to do. One of the things I know for myself, and I was saying to my daughter, like there's just some things that we've been taught to sing. Like, and I, I've taught all of my children, I'm gonna say the song, and I know most of you are gonna know what the song is, right? Allah made me Muslim. Who doesn't know the words of that song? It's just like growing up Muslim, we all know the song to that because Allah made the corn for my what? <laughs> cornflakes. That's right, Hayat. He made the corn for my cornflakes. Okay. <laughs> corn for my cornflakes. Allah, Allah did. did. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is she talking about? I know what she's talking about. There you, go. you see? So. <laughs> That but just brings us all together. We can listen. We can listen to him. Even though he plays guitar, we can listen to him. We can listen to that. All day. It was like, turn that on. Turn that on. That's all true, I though, made it. Cat Stevens got a, a way with a lot, though. Um, uh -huh. The one that was on um, uh, Capital A. For Allah, nothing I'm but Allah. Allah. Right. That, that is for the beginning of this. Of this love. Love. Yes. That's what Takwa be wary of. Be on Adam's and I liked his stuff the best. And I, I had him his video cassette and I could never find him again. And it was like, he's like, come on, Juma, Juma. Come on, Juma, Juma. <laughs> <laughs> My kids used to be in the back of that. Oh, God, Sahir or something like that is his last name. And uh, he had a whole cassette and everything like that. And it was just like, yeah, yeah. but that, that's very nice. And that's very sweet and everything like that. But sometimes you want a hi at jam, and you, you know, I'm not a kid. I'm That's a true. grown dead old woman. That's true. That's true. I want to feel like you know. And then like, came native, and then came native Dean in the early '90s. I know about we the need, we need like a Muslim uh, the Tony Braxton <laughs> That's going to talk about the co-wife blues. Going to sing about the co-wife. <laughs> <laughs> we had we had some of that. We, we need more of that. Is what I'm saying. We some of that. We need more of that. That right, that deep, that deep so. Mm, <laughs> no, there's actually that, a you know sister I mean? like, wrote a song a long time ago that sounds a lot like um gospel. As, as a matter of fact, I, I was like, did she change the words? You know, I used to change the, the words to stuff and keep the melody, but it was like in this sinful world today, <laughs> Satan's getting in my way. Lord, he just won't Woo. let me be. Won't you please deliver me? I'm like, that's straight out the church. But yeah. we sang it as a Nashi. <laughs> we sure did. Because <laughs> yeah. that's our style. That's just yeah. our style. You know what I'm saying? That's our that's style. That's our tradition. Right. And right. <laughs> and, we made it out of and to be honest, the hard part about it is we were made to feel ashamed, even though people did it. The problem is they were made to feel ashamed to do it. And that's why it didn't develop mm -hmm. because we were made to feel ashamed to be that. So that's why a lot of people didn't, and that's what I'm saying it hasn't developed. It would have developed by now. Like why, we don't even have those people anymore. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Why? <laughs> that's because you're told that that's not halal. That's not, not, not even that's not halal. So I'm, I'm perfectly fine with those, ty those type of discussions. It's all right. Yeah. You know, we can go back and forth and everything like that. That's not Muslim. Okay, meaning that because it didn't come from a very specific social identities construct. Demographic. Demographic, okay, it's not Daisy, it's not Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. People right. were, but, but let's be, let's let's take it all the way back. People were mad when Bilal since um um did the Adhan. Yeah, I was gonna mention that. 
I was going to mention that all those, oh, I shadow la ilaha illallah, Muhammad, everything, they got heated. They got heated because the prophet of Allah told this black man with this awesome voice, go on and climb up on Allah's house. <laughs> And they got mad. They got mad, mad, mad. And that's what I said is that nothing has changed since then. Yeah, we don't have. Unfortunately, we don't have the promise of something to speak up for us no more because that's been happening ever since. Mm -hmm. Every time, and, and and the more beautiful the voice, the more upset they get. Yep, yep. And even like I, I remember I was in one. Like I have like a couple of Quran recitation classes, a study groups that I go to, and everything like that. And so I, I've been blessed to have teachers from different backgrounds, right? And so there is this one sister from West Africa. Oh my <laughs> God. <laughs> when she recites Quran, it shakes your soul. It's like this a law's word. You're going to listen to it right now. Okay. And, and, and I had, and I heard, People in the study group complain about her voice being loud, being this, being that, and being the label that I am. I'm just like, that's your racism. That's what that is. So, <laughs> so let's move along with that. Let's move along to get along. That's it. Cause she sounds beautiful and she's your teacher. She sounds 20 times better than you. And you probably never will sound this good. Yeah. And it's just like, it's like this whole idea of the voice that carries the soulfulness in the voice. It's not nasally, okay? All of these different small aspects that people can automatically, a lot of times identify with blackness. That's why they think people like Christina Aguilera were black, was black, you know? And what's that guy, uh, what you won't do for love? Oh my God. I don't know, I don't remember which one because it was a number of them. That and yeah, the they didn't even realize it was before Michael yeah. Bolton. They thought Michael Bolton was black too. But right. okay. oh, yeah. Bobby, Bobby Caldwell, Bobby Caldwell. Bobby Caldwell. Bobby when Caldwell. I found out he was white, I, I had I almost had a heart attack. I, 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 <laughs> right. I was fighting like, what? Because it's just like this thing. It's just like this thing. That man had soul. That man has soul. He definitely had soul. So it was just like this automatic idea. So it's like when you associate that with blackness and you have an, a problem with blackness, you're going to have a problem with that. You know, I, have a problem with that. I was going to say, do you think that sometimes folks co-sign, like when we get dressed and stuff, like, you know, you know, as a convert, you know, you just, I don't know, you say, okay, Islam is like you look in this cookie cutter, this cookie cutter box and says, okay, I have the buyer, this Egyptian or this whatever style and you pull it out. Instead of just, you know, dressing like, you know, in a conservative way, we go right to this style. We have a whole cameo on, a whole, you know, the whole outfit looking <laughs> like I'm heading towards that. I, I'm serious. And it's just like, we were you know, very, I, have, we I have the buy. I am guilty. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were very much directed towards that. That was the thing. It was just like shed as much of your uh, uh, first, it, like on a broader as, as aspect, westernness. Mm -hmm. On a very uh, on, on a on a microcosm aspect, your blackness. That's that's even less tolerable. Okay, so you're very much directed. Well, we can't do anything about the skin. Now, can we? No. But. <laughs> We can drench you like this and tell you to wear this and tell you where that. And we know better because our grandfather, great, great, great grandfather was the sheikh on the mountain back in the day. So we know, you know, we've been had with generational Muslims. So we know, yeah, that definitely, African-American Muslims definitely had a, a, a game run on them. Okay. But we have since come out of that, haven't we? So <laughs> we've been working it out. Yeah, we've been working it out. It, we definitely can work it out because it's just like that. Was, that wasn't even something that was in the time of the prophet. So I'm like, he had a Roman robe or cape or something like that. That was bright red or maroon red or something like that. So it's not mm -hmm. like you know, it's like this is this is this it, this there's Islamic dress. And then there's Muslim. Dress. And it's not a, yeah. And right. Islamic dress is far broader than muslim dress you know muslim dress is a very specific thing to very specific culture what does that even mean <laughs> it's, you know what it I mean? Means oh no i know I, what you mean i was being sarcastic oh. <laughs> you know the funny the funny thing about it is that traveling 
well, the funny thing about traveling is you see that it means different things to different people depending on where you are. Even that, like, you know, certain people, like, even, for example, the, we were talking about singing. Like, it's not taboo to sing in South Africa. Like, Muslim I don't women, like men in sandals. I don't like men wearing sandals. Like, I'm sorry. That's, I'm sorry. That was random. I had to say it. <laughs> I did come out of nowhere. Like, okay, sis. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay. you're only going to see everyone's head, so there's no triggers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what you what you find is that even and even when you look at schools of thought schools of thought were actually created uh, often by re like there was it was what people followed in their region and the region had different ways of you know so they came up with their different things you know based on what how they study and how they perceive things as well so like when you go travel you'll find that they and every group of muslims you notice they emphasize some things and then they don't don't emphasize another that's one I thing like i learned about traveling like they'll tell you that you, as a woman you can't wear a pair of pants, but they clean shaving us all get out, and it's like, dude, like, <laughs> can we can you can you just look in the mirror for a second and realize? And, and you know what I noticed? Folks are taking off their mustache too. Like, what's happening? Like, I'm well, like, that was like, always that was. You know, my that son Rob said that he had he needed to take off his beard and his mustache. I'm like, y'all really going way too that far. That was always recommended. It was always re it's all it's recommended that you grow the beard and that your mustache is is, is thin, yeah. very is thin. Not that yeah, you have to take it off. Did somebody else do that? No, no, but there's a style now. Well, it's been for that whole that whole style of, of shaving this. You're supposed to trim it, but some people shave it and then just leave the whole beard like that. Right. Yo, my husband is not allowed to <laughs> shave anything. That's a problem. But seriously, though, <laughs> um, but seriously though, I'm gonna go make his plate because nobody can't uh, yeah, it's cut time to roast wrap beef up. but me. The mom was bought to me, and I better eat it before it get cold. <laughs> see, uh, <laughs> you see how much fun we having out there in the virtual world. I know, right? I have to tune in every Sunday and Thursday because we're going to get it popping. Every right. Sunday and Thursday. Do not. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for typing in. Thank you for asking for the song requests and everything like that. We will be back Sunday, eleven thirty a.m. with the youth authors panel is going to be popping and everything like that the Ujuar is going to be back in a great group of black muslim youth authors 11 30 a.m right here on about a slam i left uh the link to register so that you get updates and reminders that we're going that we got we're about to go on and also people ask for the mugs so we have mugs we have t-shirts we have uh, pillows we have hoodies we have all kinds of stuff so visit our conference store and you can pick out whatever it is that you would like you have a commemorative mug and all that great stuff there's a lot of swag going on over there all right don't black forget on both visit. sides black on both sides okay don't forget to visit us at www.aboutislam.net thank you to our sponsor about a slam and all our other sponsors NBA Muslims, Muslim Girl Reads, Every Kind of Lady, Hot Hijab, Muslim Anti-Racism Collaborative, Heart Women and Girls, Daybreak Press, of African American Muslim Alliance of Tampa, and the Muslim Connection. I can't wait to see everyone on Sunday, inshallah. You guys enjoy your weekend, and we're going to get it popping off again, all right? Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum.